Thank you so much, Lotika. And a big thank you to Team IDEC, Dr. Sanjay sir, Dr. Neeta, Dr. Archana, Dr. Anjali, Dr. Nitin, Shilpa Joshi, all of you, fantastic job, new venue and logistically challenging. So great job. Uh, very humbled to be here. I think I'm already quivering with having such stalwarts in the audience, but let's go for it. So the CV risk assessment and the best engine for Indians, well, we all know that cardiovascular disease is burgeoning, and especially in Southeast, South Asia, including India with the age of onset of first myocardial infarction being 10 years earlier than in other countries. Two big trials, the interheart and interstroke, have found nine key risk factors responsible for more than 86% of the cardiovascular disease, being smoking, uh, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, diet, physical inactivity, alcohol consumption, and psychosocial factors. So we know cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death in India, causing over 28% of total deaths. And more than 50% of cardiovascular death or disease mortality occurring in individuals less than 50 years of age, making all this very relevant. But certain uh, risk nuances, especially in Indians, this was global, but especially in Indians, let's say that prevalence of diabetes, as we know, is consistently higher in South Asians than in any other population, and those with diabetes have definitely higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Diabetes also reduces the life expectancy by 10 years, and the main cause of death is attributable to cardiovascular disease. Genetic makeup and early onset of the conventional risk factors in Indians contributes to this excessive cardiovascular disease risk. Tobacco use may be variable across uh, the population. Dyslipidemia profile of South Asians is also very typical with small, dense LDL uh, particles, high triglyceride levels, and low HDL levels because of less physical activity. Besides, dyslipidemic, uh, dyslipidemia features like lipoprotein A this, and inflammatory markers like the CRP, homocysteine, and uh, plasma, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 levels are also found to be higher in South Asians as compared to the Caucasian population. We also observe that cardiovascular disease increases with rising fasting plasma glucose levels, again something that's typical of the Asian population. So given this very strong relationship between diabetes and cardiovascular complications, we need to address both and we cannot remove one from the other. And of course, a multifactorial risk factor reduction has to be uh, aimed at. So determining the risk of an event not only helps physicians, but also patients from consideration of targeted inventions, interventions for prevention of future events, especially when you integrate everything with the patient's clinical scenario, social background, and other information that we have. And that becomes a framework for healthcare providers to recommend therapy and help patients also plan for the future. I think this is very important. It it's, looks very complicated. All I'm trying to say is we need risk engines that are easy for even patients to interpret and use because this is going to impact their lifestyle and everything. I mean, lifestyle factors are extremely important in conferring that cardiovascular disease risk and also diabetes. So again, the, the place where they all meet cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, well, on a genetic background with lifestyle, obesity, insulin resistance, glycation and the uh, 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 dyslipidemia and severe hypoglycemia all contribute to outcomes like hypertension, cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and stroke. So all this culminates into a really pathetic clinical outcome. Non-conventional cardiovascular risk factors include coronary artery calcium, carotid intima media thickness, aortic pulse wave ve velocity, CRP, lipoprotein A, little a, and homocysteine and other markers. 
Our approach for prevention of ASCVD would typically consider non-modifiable risk factors as well, modifiable risk factors as you all can see here. Now something about risk assessment engines, because they are the fundamental uh, principle of anything in preventive cardiology. And CV risk prediction and estimate, uh, estimation sim uh, systems have all been developed for both prevention as well as management of cardiovascular disease. With the prognostically relevant information that we derive from all these engines, we can draw up a framework for selecting the nature and the intensity of therapy like statins as well as aspirin. Different guidelines have recommended different engines to assess the 10-year risk. And traditionally, this risk assessment is developed from determination of the uh, presence of major cardiovascular risk factors and then applying different algorithms and prediction charts to determine the overall cardiovascular risk in any individual. But these models should also be uh, applicable to contemporary uh, you know, population and should be validated in a specific ethnic group. For example, the 10-year risk is less than 10%, and that would be considered as low risk. 10 to 20% would be intermediate risk, and more than 20% would indicate high risk. Different guidelines have used different thresholds for defining this high risk. Most have indicated that anything beyond 15 to 20% risk of occurrence of vascular events over 10 years would be definitely indicative of a high risk population. I'm emphasizing on this because I'm going to tell you how it differs in the Indian subpopulation. Now this risk assessment in Indians, we cannot just extrapolate all the risk engines that have been developed for the Western population, right? Because actually speaking, they underestimate the risk in South Asians. We do not have prospective studies in the Indian population in terms of the risk assessment engines, and very little is known uh, as to the demonstration of how well they perform in the Indian population. Even though we know that the Indians will develop cardiovascular disease much more than the Western population. In fact, cardiovascular disease risk factors, even though tr as, as traditional as they may be, they differ in their manifestation in the Indians. For example, Kanjilal et al. reported in 2008 or so uh, on three different scoring systems, and in a minute I will introduce those to you, risk FRS or score and an earlier version of JBS risk force risk score were all compared and reported that among family members of those with cardiovascular disease, there was less than 5% risk uh, or high risk population. Now this population in fact had not only family history of cardiovascular disease, but also elevated lipids, pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic, and other markers of cardiovascular disease. So clearly this was very obvious that something is wrong with these risk engines. It's not clearly giving us what we need. And just hold that thought because the NICE guidelines have said that something called as a Q-risk 2 or Q-risk 3 can be considered as the most important for our population. Uh, just a quick look at the cardiovascular risk factors across India and the United States over 25 years. You can see that all these risk factors, the prevalence or the presence has differed considerably over 25 years, and there is a difference between what is uh, more important or relevant in the United States as compared to what is relevant for our Indian population. So what exists are very, uh, a whole lot of risk engines out there. Uh, for example, the Framingham risk score, which was developed many years ago, and now there exist several modifications to the FRS calculator also, is universally known as the best one. The QRIS2 model also exists with further modifications. Then you have the ACC AHA pooled cohort equations. You also have the ASCVD risk calculator. You have something called as the third joint British societies, which is a JBS3 risk score. 
you have ProCam, you have SCORE, you have the WHO International Society of Hypertension Cardiovascular Risk Prediction Charts, and so on and so forth. Let's remember once again that calculators are used in clinical practice to identify, intervene in the high-risk population, as well as to communicate this effectively to all our patients so that the modifiable risk factors can be taken care of. In terms of, this is a quick comparison of four very, very important uh, cardiovascular risk assessment models, the FRS, ACC AHA risk score, the WHO risk prediction charts, and the JBS risk score. And you can see several factors are taken into consideration, and then everywhere there's a cross, those factors are not even considered by those engines. For example, the FRS does not account for family history of premature cardiovascular disease. I don't even have to convince you how important it is, right? And then JBS risk score on the right, well, says yes to a whole lot of things, including the BMI consideration, which all others are not considering. So that is, again, very relevant for the Indian population. Overall, if they uh, really look at the uh, ethnicity or the race, then we have Framingham is completely out, but we have the pool cohorts, which is the ACC and the AHA risk score, the score risk score, and the Q risk uh, risk score, which is important because it does account for ethnicity as well. Now, age also drives most of the cardiovascular risk. For example, the ASCVD risk calculator, and an example given here is a 50-year-old white male uh, with controlled blood pressure, well, marginally elevated lipids, no diabetes, no, non-smoker, and not on any other chronic uh, medication, not even a statin or an aspirin. His age, as per the ASCVD calculator, is 2.6%, and... The same scenario with a 70-year-old becomes 15.3%. So this is just to highlight the fact that age is such a strong determinant of the cardiovascular risk factor as per ASCVD. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just trying to say that there is a difference and age is driving most of this risk. Now, in terms of the age considerations for global cardiovascular disease risk assessment, well, we know that uh, for those less than 50 years, probably atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is more relevant than heart failure, and the time frame for risk assessment would be a decade or so. Uh, similarly, for those above 75 years, heart failure would be more prominent, and uh, the risk assessment time frame would be three to five years. The predictive value of traditional risk factors is very high for those less than 50 years of age, and also with elevated biomarkers of subclinical cardiac injury, it, it's infrequent and variable. So even with a perfect risk pro factor profile, say a male above 65 or a woman above 70 would have at least a borderline ASCVD risk by this particular engine. Thus, we need to incorporate risk-enhancing factors because we need to fine-tune this risk assessment. Does it make sense to subject somebody who really does not have that risk for developing cardiovascular disease to further medications or further investigations? Well, it doesn't. So this is the uh, ASCVD risk gradation, and the risk enhancers like I said, between 5 and 7 point, less than 7.5 would be borderline risk. And in the presence of risk en enhancers, they recommend that we could start or initiate the statin therapy. Now, and of course, the entire gradation is very clearly uh, given here where, you know, how, when do you start statin therapy uh, in intermediate risk or high risk? And if the risk decision is uncertain, then we also need to consider additional investigations like the calcium, uh, coronary or uh, artery calcium uh, score and the gradations with that as well. The risk enhancing factors include, first of all, the family history of premature ASCVD, uh, primary hypercholesterolemia, metabolic syndrome, again, very relevant for the Indian context, chronic kidney disease, chronic inflammatory conditions, history of premature menopause, 
and associated conditions during pregnancy, high risk race and ethnicities as well, and lipid biomarkers described here. Now, as far as statin eligibility goes, these risk engines also define when will we use statins for a particular uh, population or a high-risk uh, uh, population to prevent future CVD in them. Well, there was one study which, uh, which evaluated the risk-based statin eligibility for primary prevention in accordance with the guidelines in approximately 400 non-diabetic patients who were hospitalized for MI assuming that they had had a health checkup just a day before the acute MI that was reported or they were hospitalized for. They used the score risk-based calculator recommended by the European Society guidelines, and that restricted the statin eligibility for primary prevention substantially because it reclassified non-Eastern European people from high risk to low risk. And the same people were qualified for statin therapy if we went by the NICE guidelines. So you can see the, uh, the paradoxical situation here. In fact, one of the Indian important uh, uh, studies done by Gar Naveen Garg et al. from Lucknow, they also reported that 76% of the study population was statin eligible only as for the NICE guidelines. And they found that the FRS or the Framingham score uh, risk score CVD was good for the high risk stratification of patients, but not for statin eligibility. So, you know, what would you do if you, even if you uh, qualified them as high risk, but you could not give them statin going strictly by the risk engine? So, thus, several limitations exist. Based on the Framingham Heart Study, and this was conducted, and this is based, uh, I mean, the FRS scale was developed from the Framingham Heart Study, which was uh, conducted in the US in 1998, and developed initially only for predicting coronary heart disease risk, but later on modified to predict overall cardiovascular disease risk. Also, keep in mind that it was developed at a time when the risk of cardiovascular disease in the US was peaking. It does not account for non-conventional risk factors like obesity, physical inactivity, family history, and so on, and relies heavily on age as a cardiovascular risk determinant. And we've already went through that uh, because only at a later age will your risk increase, and this is not the fact for Indians because Indians do develop cardiovascular disease at a younger age. Again, Several studies have looked at this particular comparison of the different risk engines that exist. For example, Kanjilal et al. Uh, in 2008 found that uh, among the three different scoring systems that they compared, they found that the JBS was probably, uh, I, I mean, it, it was not, all were not really good for even uh, predicting the risk level in those with family history of cardiovascular disease, because in spite of having even other contributory risk factors, the risk, the risk that these engines found was less than 5%. In fact, in a study of executives with metabolic syndrome, the FRS risk score identified only 23% as having intermediate to high risk. The risk would be much higher. Bansal et al. also compared risk scores from four different engines, including the FRS, ACC AHA risk score, JBS3 risk score, and the WHO risk score as well, and correlated these with two other important markers of cardiovascular disease, which is the carotid intima thickness and the coronary calcium score. And they found that ACC, AHA, and WHO calculators significantly underestimated the cardiovascular risk as compared to JBS3 and FRS. JB, JBS was the least likely to fail, and it was also consistently compared with CIMT and the coronary calcium score. Earlier, they had reported that JBS risk calculator was also better uh, than the others that were used. Garg et al., and I'm going to just review that very quickly. They looked at the FRS global CVD risk assessment model that stratified patients, maximum number of patients into high risk for hard CVD events, but then it looked at a combination of outcomes, including cardiovascular, I mean, including every aspect of cardiovascular disease and stroke. 
Uh, so it was not able to fine tune exactly for MI or other uh, uh, primary endpoints. So for the Indians, the Lipid Society of India uh, came up with the expert consensus statement on management of dyslipidemia in Indians, and they sort of categorized the uh, risk. Uh, uh, they categorized the risk. Uh, uh, as low risk, moderate risk, high risk, and very high risk. And if you note, the high risk is more than 15, uh, is 15 or more than 15 percent uh, risk of ASCVD deaths, MI or stroke over a period of 10 years. So here itself, the percentage has come down from 20 used by the Western population. We've come down to a 15 to stratify them as high risk. Similarly, the treatment goals and drug therapy considerations are also given very, very clearly by this uh, expert statement. And we have a comparison of studies evaluating predictive accuracy of different risk scores in the Indian population. We don't have too many, but till the 2017, there were at least four major studies which were reported and one conflicting with the other. But overall, we found that JBS3 was relevant. And then the last study, Garg et al. found that, uh, that QRS3 was a more relevant engine for the Indian population. I'll take two, three minutes more. Uh, so this was. Uh, calculators using FRS, uh, CHD, FRS, CVD, QRS2, JBS3, uh, so on and so forth. And they also looked at the eligibility for statin use uh, by using the ACC, AHA, NICE guidelines as well as the Canadian guidelines. And they found that FRS CVD risk assessment model had performed the best as it could ha find out the highest number of patients. 52% of the patients of this study were at high cardiovascular risk, while WHO and ASCVD performed very, very poorly. QRS2, JBS3, and FRS CHD have performed interme intermediately. And using the NICE guidelines, 76% of the patients, the highest in this population, was found to be eligible for statin use. So they concluded that FRS CVD appears to be the most useful one in Indians, but the difference may be because FRS CVD estimates risk for several additional outcomes as compared to the uh, other risk scores. And for statin eligibility, they said refer to the NICE guidelines because they seem to be the most appropriate for the Indian population. Just to show you that from this study, again, if you look at the 10-year risk, uh, the high risk, uh, the low risk less than 20%, say, for example, FRS-CVD, they found that 48% uh, of the population had low risk and 52% had high risk. But when you put in the uh, in non-diabetic subjects, so when you remove diabetes, then the numbers considerably change using the same, uh, the same engines. So in Indians, the 10-year CVD risk score calculators do not behave the same as in the Western population. And for identification of high cardiovascular risk groups in uh, Indians, FRS CVD is probably most useful for statin eligibility. NICE guidelines or the QRS2 is the most appropriate for the Indian population. So this was what they concluded in 2017. Come 2020 and a very ambitious group, Gosal, Samit Gosal at all, they went out there to look at the quantitative measures of asymptomatic cardiovascular disease risk in type 2 diabetes, evidence from an Indian outpatient setting. Now, during routine diabetes checkup, it's very cumbersome to do any invasive screening test, and it's also not recommended. And we know that diabetes itself is a very major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but the risk of developing events is different across the spectrum of diabetes. And stratification of cardiovascular disease risk in type 2 diabetes remains to be done. 
For example, 30% of type 2 diabetes patients may have only a five-year cardiovascular disease risk, which is similar to the general population. So given this role of so many different factors, they concluded that the QRIS score, QRIS 3 score, represents the most accurate CVD screening tool available to till date. But this is not validated. Uh, it was a small pilot study compared to the others, and it's not really validated as such. Movie, can we wind yeah, up? I'm just winding yeah. up in a minute. Again, this, this is just to highlight the fact that across durations of diabetes, the score or the, and the relative risk of cardiovascular disease changes dramatically. So this was the first ever study from India which identified CVD risk in type 2 diabetes patients who were asymptomatic and therefore definitely would have more uh, ramifications uh, going forward. 2022, and it's still in under uh, review right now, but they published a subset analysis of the original Mark study, the same group, uh, Samit Gosal and Binayak Sena et al. Uh, and they, they, look, they further analyzed this, and they said that the 23 risk uh, markers that QRIS-3 has, 22, uh, 23 actually, and these can be further brought down to just 10 elements which are highly relevant for the Indian population. So this is in process. They used, uh, uh, they used AI or they used uh, you know, computer-based technology to actually come to this conclusion from the same data. So estimation of cardiovascular risk may appear a very time-consuming process, but it's definitely worthwhile because we need to intervene and treat the high-risk population. It should assist primary prevention decisions where risk-benefit ratio may not be that favorable of giving statins or aspirin, uh, and hence it must assist all of us in making those right uh, decisions, but the ideal risk engine should definitely be validated in the applicable ethnic population, should be easily deployable, standardized, and of course, scientifically relevant. Diabetes, duration on stage of diabetes, and other risk factors are extremely important for risk engine development, which many of the traditional risk engines did not even consider. The estimation of cardiovascular risk has an added advantage that it provides an objective measure of the seriousness of the illness and may help the patient improve compliance to the treatment. Thank you very much for that patient hearing.